In US presidential politics, former President Trump continues to bounce around from courthouse to the campaign trail. This morning, he was back to face trial for his statements about former columnist E. Jean Carroll's sexual assault allegations in 2019. Just ahead of the New Hampshire primary, he got a boost from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who decided to drop out of the race and back him. Conservative lawyer George Conway now joins Michelle Martin with incisive analysis on how Trump's legal woes are playing out and shaping this campaign. Thanks, Christian. George Conway, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. So look, I know you're a lawyer and a legal analyst. You're not a political analyst per se, but I did want to get your take on what we've just seen in Iowa. As we are speaking now, the Iowa caucuses are just behind us. You know, it's, um, by all accounts, decisive victory for the former president there. Just what are your thoughts about that? Well, I mean, this is where we are. I mean, I, I've been saying for quite some time that I thought that we're going to have the first, for the first time, running as a major party candidate, a convicted felon. And that's what he, I think he will be that by the time the fall rolls around, because I do think the trial here in the District of Columbia of the January 6th trial, the one brought, the case brought by Jack Smith, just against him before Judge Chutkin here in the district, I think that one's going to go to trial. Um, you know, it's just a remarkable confluence of firsts. I mean, we have the first adjudicated rapist who is going to win a major party nomination, the first person who has been, you know, who, who is under indictment in four separate jurisdictions with 91 counts. I mean, it, it, it is just absolutely unprecedented. But with Donald Trump, it's almost it's almost inevitable that this this was going to happen. Do you have any thoughts about why these very serious allegations don't seem to make much difference in, a, in the political realm? I mean, you have, you know, close connections to people in the Republican political world, and I'm just interested in what you think about that. It's partisanship run amok, in part, and then I think a lot of this, I mean, I, and I do think there is some segment of the population that wants a strong man, um, and I, I don't mean that in a complimentary way, I mean that in the, uh, in the sense of a, of a quasi-dictatorial authoritarian figure, uh, they want to just basically assume the facts that they think are true are true. They don't want to think they don't. They're not interested in evidence. But I think another thing that's going on here, I think a lot of this is that people don't want to admit that they were wrong about Donald Trump. They don't want to admit that he's a bad person, because if they admit that he's a bad person, then they, by extension, are admitting that they are not good people for supporting him, or at least it tarnishes them in their own eyes. So they have to justify where they've been and 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 where they're going um, because they, they they just don't want to admit that he led them astray and and that they've been suckered and that that that, that they're wrong and that that he's bad. I, I think that's just a, a big part of it. Is that true? You think that's true for people in your own orbit? Oh, well, you know, I mean, my orbit's changed a bit over the last few years. But I think, you know, part of it is not wanting to admit you're wrong. But part of it also is um, there's an identity there. Uh, there's a there's a, a a tribalism there. And, you know, you don't you don't want to be excluded from the tribe because, you don't you think the other tribe, the, the liberals who you've been hating on for so many years, they're never going to accept you. And if you if you dare question uh, the leader, um, you'll be cast out of your own group and you'll be, you'll be homeless. The other thing that I think is going on is there's an economy that has been built around Trump and Trumpism. Um, I think that there's a whole you, know, you have all of these consultants and all of these politicians whose livelihoods or their chosen careers or their chosen course of of, of their lives is dependent upon not uh, antagonizing other people in that community. And so, I mean, you see that with members of Congress who are who, who have to fear being primary. You see that with political consultants. I mean, for example, uh, the, the, it was reported just the other day that the Trump 
campaign is saying nobody should hire Jeff Rowe, who was a political advisor, a chief political advisor for Ron DeSantis, that they he's going to be blacklisted and nobody wants to be blacklisted. Nobody wants to be cast out of the tribe. And there is just there's also fear of physical intimidation. I and mean, I think we saw that to some extent. Uh, with uh, Lindsey Graham back in January of 2021, where he dared utter that he'd been, he was done with Trump or something like that. And he was accosted at an airport by, by, by Trumpers. And you saw it also. I mean, one of the things that you've seen um, uh, when Liz Cheney was running for reelection in Wyoming, she had to have a big security detail in Wyoming with she never owned. And it, it, there, is a, there is certainly a degree of physical intimidation. And um, that, you know, frankly, that's what January 6th was all about. So let's pivot around to the, the subject that sort of brought us together today, which is you have actually said that you think that Trump will, quote, spend the rest of his life in jail. You really think that? I do think that. I mean, he's either going to become president or he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. He certainly deserves to spend the, life, the rest of his life in prison. I think that if you take any combination of the counts in these four indictments, uh, with which he's been charged, you will take almost any conviction and almost any combination of them is going to uh, put him in jail for a number of years. And you know, this is a this is a seventy seven year old man. So I, I I think there is a very good chance he'll spend the rest of his life in jail. And and that's part of the dynamic that is going on here. He knows that. I mean, he's not a strategic thinker. He's a he's a sociopath. He's a he's a he's a man with a reptilian. I'm not going to say intellect, but he understands that he is cornered. And that's when people, you know, people like him with that kind of psychology are the most dangerous. But he understands that and he understands that the only way for him to escape the trouble that he's in is to be elected president. Do you think that the purpose of this presidential campaign is to keep him out of jail? I think that is one major purpose. I think another major purpose is to, he does, you know, he's motivated by the things that motivate narcissistic sociopaths, which is power, um, praise, uh, and, and a desire to, to inflict revenge on people who have defied him. And I, I think that we've seen that in some of what, what, you know, what he's, his people are planning for 2025, should he be elected? I mean, they're going to they're going to seek retribution. Uh, he says he's seeking retribution on behalf of, of the American public, or at least his slice of the American public. But that's what motivates him. I don't think you can understand what Donald Trump says and does on a daily basis simply by saying, "Oh, he's a bad guy. He's a Republican. He's a authoritarian. He's he's racist. He's misogynist. He's this or that." You have to tie it into his fundamental psychological profile. People should not shy away from that, okay? Because I do not think you can understand his behavior without understanding his psychology. And I think we're seeing that in the courtroom as, as, it, as it's happening today uh, or this week in the E. Jean Carroll trial. We're going to see it even more in the future. So what, let's talk about of, of the of the he's got there are 91 felony accounts, felony accounts across four cases. What do you think is the strongest of those? Oh, well, I think the strongest one, the strongest case, I think, is a, which is a slam dunk case because it's so simple, is the case in Florida, the Mar-a-Lago documents case. Uh, you know, there, there's no there, there's really no factual dispute about what happened there because he was caught red handed with the documents. The documents do not belong to him. They belong to the United States of America. They had classified document markings. And it doesn't even matter that they were, in fact, quote unquote, classified because the charges that he has been uh, that were filed against him were, include charges under the Espionage Act. And and those charges do not turn on specific, mark, whether they're specifically marked as classified, they simply turn on whether or not it's national defense information of any degree of significant sensitivity. And you have that and the fact that there are witnesses and there's video and, and all sorts of evidence that he tried to 
hide those and did hide those documents from the FBI and that he failed to produce them when he was served with a, a subpoena by the De Department of Justice and that he had his lawyers lie to the Department of Justice. And that's those are simple, simple, easily provable acts of obstruction of justice. And when that case goes to trial, um, I think I don't know that it's going to go to trial this year because uh, it's hard to say what the judge there is doing in terms of scheduling. But I don't he doesn't have a defense in that case. Just not not a shred of a defense.